but I'm sure we'll survive. So I'm not sure if we'll get anyone else. Mondays are a tougher day. And just for fun, we had a time change or time zone change. So we are now in Eastern Standard Time here anyways. I forget where you are, Mark. Where are you? You're in California, aren't you? Yeah. 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 In Los Angeles, near Los Angeles. Uh -huh. So it's only nine where you are. You still change time as well, didn't you? Yes. And I've been in Ireland for hours. In Ireland for hours. Okay. Yeah, they started at 2 a.m. my time. I didn't join them at 2 a.m. my time, but uh, yeah. I did get in before 6 a.m. Yikes. I've had that experience. I was I know. participating in a fair's fair book sprint over a couple of weeks, and it was all on European time. So I just became European time for two weeks. It was actually kind of an interesting experience. I was up super early every morning and going to sleep well before sunset. Yes, yeah, so you have a hard time going to sleep that early. So, Yeah. Well, when you convert over completely, it's no longer early. <laughs> yeah, at least it'll be dark. So I've, I've been doing this, you know, off and on for the last two years. A lot of stuff's in Europe, right? A lot of conferences. Um, yeah. But... Now it's going to get dark at 5 p.m. local time or 5.15 local time. So maybe I'll be able to go to sleep at 7 o'clock, but I doubt it. <laughs> Speaking of conferences in Europe, there's one on AI and education from UNESCO. I'm trying to find the link for it, but I don't know if I have it on this computer. Yeah, I signed up for that. Yeah, okay, good. That's... Uh, December 7 and 8, as I recall. Oh, I'll put the link actually in the newsletter because I think it's worth signing up for, even though, again, the hours are ridiculous. But it's a fairly high-level conference. It's actually interestingly organized uh, by the People's Republic of China, even though the time zone is Europe. So, But, of course, there will be uh, speakers from all over. But I find that interesting. It's, I think it's good that there is participation from China in the whole topic of AI, AI ethics and, and learning analytics ethics. There was a diagram. I wish I could remember where it was. Um, that was the, the title was something like Landmarks of Ethics in AI from China. And it pointed to a number of really key documents. And it's similar to the sort of document that I sent out in last week's newsletter, the Field Report, with, a, again, the, the list of important papers. But they're all different papers. So I want to find that. Because, of course, it belongs as part of our, our inquiry. Yeah, I think um, looking to UNESCO, now that they have this major initiative, mm -hmm. You know, I keep one eye on them, kind of, but I think now it'll be more active engagement. Um, yeah. Because here in the U.S., I can't get any traction with uh, further education, as the Scots call it. Mm -hmm. uh, here, adult education is considered remedial, or they consider you to be just like the other 18-year-old students. There yeah. just is no recognition of, um, you know, adults, informal learning, lifetime learning, on-the-job training. There's just no recognition of any of that in, it, in higher education. So, Which is funny true. because it's such a, a large part of the European approach. Well, and because it's a large part of the student body. Um, yeah. And, and it is here in the, you know, for years I've been throwing around the numbers of, you know, meetings Mm -hmm. uh, inside institutions, it's like, look, half of us <laughs> have jobs. We're adults. Come on, yeah. you know. This and you know, uh, like uh, I mentioned, I think it was last week and the week before. You know, pedagogy is a perfectly at you know perfectly good thing for developmental people. Mm -hmm. Half of us are 
you know, beyond developmental education, we're looking for something else. Yeah. Whether it's andragogy or hodagogy or whatever. Whatever, uh, yeah. But, yeah, but the, um, the system here just won't let go of, we're here to help 18-year-olds develop and to be uh, cogs in the empire's machine. That's basically well, all. It's a very good business model for them. Um, you know, mm. there's the, the overall <laughs> ethos that in, in, you know, especially in the Western world that people who are 18 to 22 will take four years and go to a residential university and pay a lot of tuition for this experience. And, uh, you know, and there are some institutions, by no means all, but some who have over the years made billions of dollars doing this. Um, and I know that because that's the size of their endowments. <laughs> yeah, and those few are fine. Um, yeah. But um, as you know, Brian Alexander is tracking the decline of the educational institutions, uh, yeah. particularly in America, but I think he keeps an eye on the whole world. And their, their model is failing uh, on many levels in the United States. Uh, first of all, two thirds of us don't have a degree. And that feeds into this distrust of the educated, which yep. we're seeing play out in politics. And, you know, so actually the model is collapsing. You know, it was good for a long time, you know, when it was specifically targeted at training immigrants to work in factories and, and their managers at the same time, it yep. worked. But that's not the world we live in. So there's a, you know, the dissatisfaction is rising and something's going to have to give. I would prefer that the educational institutions give and open it up to the working class and the underclass and whatever you want to call it, the, the vast majority of Americans, and try to help them out somehow, you know. Yeah. Whether it's on but you know, that's my perspective as well. And it's interesting because, um, you know, when you take that sort of perspective with respect to ethics, you know, I mean, you ask, you know, what are the ethics for these institutions? You know, I mean, I mean you're, you're talking about a practical consideration, and I agree with that, that, you know, I mean, if they don't adopt a more open policy, they're going to collapse. But I think also there is that ethical dimension to what they're doing. Uh, is it ethically appropriate for universities to preserve existing power structures and and uh, you know, and fail to support you know the legitimate aspirations of the majority of the population. I would argue that it's not, but you know, how do you how do you approach such an argument? Well, I often uh, I was very unpopular in my institution. Uh, I have to say, I was a student leader and a shit disturber, mm -hmm. uh, and we got some things done. But uh, and then when we left, they undid most of them. Um, but anyway. Uh, as I like to point out in those meetings, um, I'm not just a student. I'm a lifetime taxpayer. Yeah. And they, they really do not like that being brought up uh, in their meetings. You know, I've been paying your salaries for decades. And then I come to you to help get retrained. And you can't do it. Your institution, yeah. uh, you know, not you personally. Well, and personally, then, they, you know, they're all people that have transitioned from immigrant and working class status to bourgeois status. They have a, you know, they have a good paying job. And the, there's some, and you know, there's some psychological thing going on. I don't know, but uh, they, they don't want to recognize the working class and the taxpayers and, you know, the people that, you know, that put them in those chairs, those positions. Um, I'm in a, a class on intercultural communication and we had an assignment to, um, to find a, peer-reviewed paper on, an, on a different culture. So I went looking for a paper on American working class culture. Right. Nothing. Which is a bit surprising, actually, because, I mean, it's certainly a large culture. You um, think? Yeah. <laughs> and kind of successful when you look at, you mm -hmm. know, um, what it builds. Yeah. It's had better days, um, Absolutely. you know, but I mean, uh, and, and, you know, between the two of us, we could probably sit down and list some of the attributes of that culture. 
Um, you know, we, we can think about, for example, their attitudes toward work. It's good. Um, you know, their attitude toward helping your neighbor. You should. Um, you know, and even things like community service, you should be part of the uh, fire department. Uh, if you have a volunteer fire department, which many of these communities do, um, you know, um, you should maybe belong to one of the service clubs, perhaps, or minimally, you certainly support what the service clubs are doing because they're building parks and helping people in hospitals and things like that. Um, you know, uh, there's a range of these honest. things. Pardon? You should be honest. You should be humble. Mm-hmm. Right? A man's a man. Right? Yeah. Well, Being humble is a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Equality. You know? Yeah. I mean, and I cannot find that list. I've been looking for a year now. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was way before this class assignment, I realized that there is nothing about yeah. the American working class being published by the academic class. I'm just you know, shocked. You can find plenty on British, you know, their class conscious. Let me just check that now. Now, I'm, now my curiosity is a little is more okay, piqued than it was. Live, live Google search. <laughs> okay. Working class ethics. All right. Okay, so you might find one or two there. I, I was specifically talking about working class culture as a culture, nothing. Okay. Ethics, you'll find one or two things. Okay, let's try culture. Yeah, it was I've the got... culture part that I was shot. There, there's no recognition of it being a separate culture. In... All right, there's a Wikipedia article. Oh yeah, oh, there's plenty of that. Oh, sure. Blog yeah. posts, you know, I was talking about peer reviewed, you know, academic yeah. journal articles. So here we go. It's uh, and see also blue collar labor history, proletarian novel. Sure, we'd be thinking of people like Faulkner, perhaps. Definitely not people like uh, Jack Kerouac or uh, who wrote um, Catcher in the Rye. I forget. Salinger, J.D. Salinger. Yeah, like Salinger's Holden Caulfield is a you know, to me, he's the opposite of working class culture. He's an entitled, complaining, anyhow. But okay, so we're looking for. Um, so I'm a big fan of uh, Charles Bukowski. Okay. I don't know if you know him. He was a Los Angeles author, worked in a post office. Even that, okay. you know, is upper working class. American working class culture. Okay. Google Scholar. There you go. Yeah. Oh, geez. Yeah. Goodbye, boys. I die a true American. That's a quote from the terrific film, uh, Gangs of New York. Ah. Um, but that's American working class culture in the uh, mid 1800s. That's not contemporary. Exactly. Yeah, and there, you know, and there are books. There were books written about working class culture, you know, but they were all from the yeah. 30s, 40s, and 50s. You know, there's there's just nothing going on. So. Yeah, this is 1979. Let's let's look for say since 2017, archaeology. Uh, this is interesting. The pedagogy of class teaching working class life and culture in the economy or in the in the academy of course it's a book so we can't read it online uh it just came out in 2020 um so that's which is too bad uh i wonder if there's any reviews or anything okay here we go J store again, which won't help us, but it'll give us a little bit. Okay. Yeah, stories like mine provide a picture of working class students having quote made it, yet still feeling like outsiders 
continually immersed within the discursive and ideological conflicts they depict between working class and academic cultures. I feel that, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, everybody that comes to working class does. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I spiteful myself. I don't think I've ever directly addressed a professor or somebody with a PhD as a class trader, but you know, <laughs> the thought has crossed my mind. Yeah. Um, in, this, in this scenario, we read working class and academic discourses exist in a dichotomous relationship where one discourse is depicted as an almost complete opposition to the others. Yep. Working class students succeed only if their class identity is stripped away. Yep. Sound right? It's like you do to ethnic people. You know, it's yeah. like it's the deficit model, right? Yours mm -hmm. is a deficit culture. You need to transform yourself into the dominant culture. You know, and it's like, no, the work and the working class, you know, has a long tradition predating America of saying no. <laughs> no, I'm not stripping myself of my culture for you. It's not going to happen. So. No, this, this, what I just quoted, was by Donna LaCourt in her article from 2006, Performing Working Class Identity in Composition Toward a Pedagogy of Textual Practice. It's a uh, college English. Uh, that's the journal it's in. Uh, yeah, so or again, it's, you know, the performance of being working class, it's not yeah. analysis of the culture of the working class. That's what I was looking for. And believe me, I spent a lot of hours on it. And, you know, oh, I, I believe. Better in research skills than I do, but if you come up with something, let me know, because I could couldn't find it. Yeah, anything. I'm not seeing, as, as you say, a whole lot here. Um, a working class academic pedagogy. That's not really working class culture. Yeah. Yeah, see, that's the thing. I was specifically looking for, as an example of intercultural communication. So I wanted to be about the culture and, and hopefully the way they communicate, but that was too much. Yeah. But just something about the working class culture in the last, you know, published in the last 60 or 70 years. Yeah. It's not there. So anyway. I don't want to derail your, your whole thing. I like this. It's This one's called The Invention of Working Class Culture. <laughs> it's uh, neoliberalism right. and working class lives. Yeah, well, I, British cultural studies. Yeah. Here's something from 2020 called There is a Genuine Working Class Culture. So again, it's a book, so we can't read it. Yeah, in fact, uh, Jack Metzger is one of the founders of the Working Class Studies Association. So there's now one group in America that's just starting to publish, and that's their first okay. book right there. So let's find Jack Metzger. Does he have a homepage? Maybe he does. Working Class. That's the Working Class Studies association page right and they have a conference i just discovered them a couple of years ago i was all uh signed up i had an airbnb and i paid my fees i was all ready to go to their conference in youngstown ohio last year but you yeah. know yeah totally. so do you think yeah i mean this is interesting and it's not really what I intended to talk about, but who cares? Yeah, that's, I'm sorry to. to no, that. no, it's fine. I mean, do you think working class culture uh, transcends other cultural boundaries? And here I'm thinking of race and gender and religion and language. Do you think it's a common culture across these? I think it's complicated. <laughs> In fact, I know it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so I see it as another intersectional standpoint, is the right? Way I, right? Um, you know, and there's a critique that white people reach for class to avoid yeah. <clears throat> ethnic identity. I get that, um, but on the other hand, uh, when you can't find anything about your class, <laughs> uh, and you can find. Um, you know, black studies departments, Latino studies departments, yep. Asian studies departments, 
and there's no working class studies department, you're like, okay, yeah. I get your criticism, but I got one of my own. So uh, another thing, so that led me to think, okay, let's, um, let's go for uh, ethnic identity. There mm -hmm. are zero Scottish studies programs in the United States of America. Really? Yeah, uh, really, really. And does Scots have any influence on the creation of the dominant American culture? Oh, I'd say so. You think? Yeah. I mean, uh, the Scottish Enlightenment is huge. Adam Smith, David Hume, uh, continuing through to John Stewart. Well, John Stewart Mill is more English than Scottish, but still. Yeah. Uh, yeah, huge. Yeah. So there, you know, there's Celtic mm -hmm. studies, right? But I think they do more dancing than uh, class analysis. Yeah. But, uh, and, and, yeah. And Scottish isn't strictly Celtic anyways. I mean, the modern Scottish states. I mean, uh, it, you, you go to Scotland now and, uh, you know, there is a very clear modern Scottish identity, which isn't just the, the you know, which isn't the traditional, I mean, it includes all of the traditional Scottish elements. But and there are many, and the Celts are one element. Yeah, and there are many, and the Celts are one element. But the modern Scottish state, as I see it, is, is, is open, it's diverse, it's progressive. Um, you know, these are, you know, and so it's a very, it's, it's a very distinct identity for sure. Yeah. Um, In fact, uh, I found a YouTuber named Bruce Fummy, F-U-M-M-E-Y, who is half Ghanaian mm -hmm. and half Scottish. And I found him because he did it. He, so he does a whole series of videos. He's a former teacher and now he does travel log, uh, a cross between travel logs and Scottish history. So he goes to places and tells the story. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I found it because one of this is called Can Black People Be Scottish? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because he responded to a comment he made, you know, so somebody watched one of his videos and made this comment. How ironic. How and ironic. And I know for a fact black that there were black people who were Scottish. About Scottish history. Yeah. And so he was, so he made this whole video responding to that. But he has like four dozen videos and a, excellent grasp of Scottish history. I mean, you know, I've spent a certain amount of time, like one of my grandfathers came from Inverness, Scotland. So I've, I've spent a bunch of time trying to learn yeah. about Scotland. Never been there, but, um, and as far as I watch, you know, at least a dozen of Bruce Fummy's videos and they're spot on culturally. And he, he has a whole series, the Picts, the Skelt, the Celts, the Angles, the Saxons, the Normans, you know, each one an individual influence. I mean, he's, to me, he's doing an excellent job. And he's just a YouTuber, he makes money doing this, and apparently runs tours on the side or whatever. So, yeah, so very fun. What's, what's interesting about this discussion, and, and there will probably be people watching this wondering, well, why, why is any of this relevant yeah. at all? Uh, but, but I think it's, it's actually pretty much on topic even for this module, because this module is um, approaches to ethics. And, uh, you know, in, in Canada, we had a book written by a guy called John Ralston Saul, uh, who's uh, uh, interestingly the husband of a former Canadian governor general. Uh, I didn't know that. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I shouldn't say husband. I think partner might be more accurate, but I'm not sure exactly. Um, and uh, who was it? Yeah, I'm a big fan of his lectures that became a book. Yeah, I have to, I have to look it up because I've forgotten who the governor general was, which is really bad because that's, you know, the Canadian head of state and, you know, it's like forgetting a president. <laughs> yeah, I try, but I can't forget some of those presidents. 
Um, I have like Adrian Clarkson or something like that in my head, but I'm not really sure that that's right. Adrian Clarkson. Is that right? Yeah, according to Google. Oh, okay. Very good. Oh, so I did remember it after all. I feel much better because I couldn't find it. And so, they were married in 1999. So it was. They, okay. They were that might have been after. Well, I'm not sure. Anyhow, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me whether they were married or not. Um, but, but I guess it does marry to other people. It does matter to other people. Uh, anyhow, um, his. I mean the the idea of Voltaire's bastards. Yeah, that's it. Is is essentially, you know, and I'm glossing over a lot of this, but essentially it's a a critique of rationalism, and even more to the point, a critique of the idea that um, of, of of the idea of using reason properly, so called to reach for things like moral truths or how we structure society, et cetera. It's, it's the, you know, it's the, the dictatorship of the reasonable over everyone else, I guess. Me, me, I'm putting words in his mouth here. I'm sure he never said that. Oh, that's a great phrase, isn't it? The dictatorship of the reasonable. <laughs> um, but I, I think that is at least a part of this distinction that can be drawn here between working class culture and academic culture in the sense that uh, whatever the working class person says, the academic is gonna have an answer based in reason or perhaps rationalization. Um, that that and doesn't the, work, they reach for authority. In the fact doesn't work, they reach for authority, yeah. Um, Although the working class might also reach for authority of a different sort. So, you know. Um, Doesn't you know, work in settings in my experience, but you know, I'm just a worker. Yeah. Well, you know, workers unite. Uh, you know, the, the, the power of labor unions is, is very much a, a worker, working class kind of cultural value, although that has waned in recent years. But I would argue not really because workers didn't want it but um i would argue again, there was a, a class war wage yeah so and you know I think, by at college educated people i mean this is where you get you know on the slippery part of the argument yeah it was the college educated who waged the war it wasn't their idea but mm -hmm. they run the institutions that have carried out the neoliberal agenda, which to me was a class war, in an oversimplified way, very oversimplified way. And our understanding of ethics, and especially ethics in an academic discipline, comes from this rationalist perspective to a large degree. Um, I've got slides, which... I don't know if I'll present to one person here, but I'll do them later. Anyways, in, in a video. You're welcome. Yeah, I know, but I, I think it's better to have a conversation here and then I'll just present them later and you can watch the video because that seems a bit nicer. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, if there were two of you, that would be an audience. And then I'd yes. want to present. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, one is not an audience, I don't think. I think audience is a part of it. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, we, we think of ethics of whatever, and we think of, you know, uh, reasons and principles and arguments, maybe explanations, uh, codes of ethics, like we've just done, um, ethics as something that you have to be educated in order to understand uh, to quite a degree. Um, you know, and, you know, there's a certain sense of that. I mean, the reason why this course exists is because there's a whole lot of people, not just working class people, but academics too, who make pronouncements on the ethics of this and that without actually understanding ethics at all. 
um, and that bothers me. And, and actually, it bothered me uh, because they didn't understand ethics at all. They didn't understand AI and analytics at all, and they didn't understand learning at all. And, and it, it made for a bad combination. Um, and you get these horribly naive statements. Now that sounds like a classic, oh, you know, here's an academic talking about somebody who doesn't know anything. And, you know, and I know how that sounds, <laughs> um, believe me, because, you know, uh, if somebody comes to me and says, well, you can't have an opinion on this because you're coming from a naive perspective. I know how I would respond to that and it's not well. Um, in fact, I have responded to it in the past and it hasn't been well. Yeah. Um, so I get that. So, but even the people who present themselves as knowing all of this stuff don't. <laughs> And, and, and that's when it begins to bother me, right? And, and that's when we see something like ethics used not as a domain of inquiry, but as a club. Um, and that doesn't strike me as the purpose of ethics at all. Um, and so, you know, I mean, if, if you're going to use it as a weapon, which you shouldn't, but if you're going to, it really should be like a fine-tuned sword, not a club. <laughs> um, you know, that's yeah. just my prejudice speaking there. But, uh, you know, uh, at, at the very least. But, um, but it bothers me. And, and, and so, and that's why I actually, that is why I took the approach to this course that I did. Most approaches to and ethics in anything kind of course, will map out all the ethical theories first. And the idea is that you as a student are supposed to look at all these ethical theories and pick one, and you will be arguing from that perspective for the rest of the course. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, that's kind of how research in education and especially research in ed tech is done generally, isn't it? You're, you're given all these frameworks like uh, instructivism, constructivism, behaviorism, cognitivism, connectivism, and they're all laid out in front of you and you pick one and you say, that is the lens through which I will see the world. And ethics is presented in the same way. And that doesn't feel right to me. Uh, no, because, I would reach for grounded theory and say, pick a situation, document it, and see what emerges. That to me is a more useful. And that's thing. more of the approach that I've taken, right? Uh, in painstakingly outlining all of the different applications and painstakingly outline all the issues that have come up that I have found. And I'm still adding applications and issues. I can't believe I missed in the list of applications um, content summarization. And I'm sort of going, Duh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I've added that. And therefore, I, I, may I try to avoid those at all costs. <laughs> Well, it depends, you know, I mean, I, I see that it's a big time saver. I get it. If, you know, if yeah. I was being paid to do research, I would have yeah. to use it, but I'm not and I don't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but there's, there's a whole, this is a bit of an aside, but it's worth mentioning. There's a, there's a whole school of doing research. And I see it a lot at NRC where the model is you do a literature search. Um, and so you'll go into your, uh, your publication repository or your publication library or your index system like Scopus or whatever, and you'll put in your keywords and you'll get 
a search and that reveals, you know, 714 documents or whatever. And then you apply search terms to that or filtering criteria and bring it down to a certain amount. And then that's your basis uh, for your literature review, which of course you will do every time you do a new study and that's scientific method. Um, I've lost track of why I was going off on that tangent. Um, but, oh yeah. Well, about methodology. Yeah. And the theory and how you uh, are approaching this course. Yeah. So these literature searches would be guided by that methodology. And they'll, they'll look for all of the, you know, all of the constructivist literature on the use of the letter A in, or whatever, you know, I'm caricaturing, obviously. And that, again, still feels wrong. And it especially feels wrong in a domain like ethics. Um, you know, if we think about ethics, can we, you know, have we advanced our knowledge of ethics if we do a literature search in that way? I mean, doing any reading, sure, is going to advance your knowledge. Um, but do you actually know more about ethics after such a search than you did before? And it's not clear to me that that's the case. I'm sort of, you know, I'm, I'm struggling through fog here. Uh, well, and being fog. working class and sort of um, pragmatic by nature, mm -hmm. um, are you then more ethical? You act more ethically after that literature search and I, even the completion of your research project. Arguably, I was more ethical before, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that. now the flip side of that is something called folk theory. Um, and in the philosophy of mind, we see this. And I'm using the philosophy of mind here because it's a really good example. Um, and so in, in the philosophy of mind, we have something called folk psychology. And folk psychology is the idea that of common, ordinary, everyday psychological states that we have. Beliefs, knowledge, truth, uh, fears, hopes, desires, etc., And maybe a bit of a story about how they have a causal impact, for example. Uh, if you want something, you will go get that something. Or if you, know, if you have a desire for something, you're more likely to work for it. You know, there's, there's a whole range of common aphorisms that come for that and come out of that. And, and you can construct a, a fully blown psychological theory based on folk psychology. And people have done that. And in fact, it's, you know, it's probably the, the dominant theory in philosophy of mind. Um, but what if it's wrong? And there's another perspective, which I actually think is closer to being correct, to the effect that there aren't really any such things as beliefs or desires or hopes uh, maybe we could say there are emotions, but we'd really have to revisit how we describe that and so on and so forth, right? And folk psychology is just based on a misinterpretation of our own mental states. I mean, we think we understand our own mental states, but really we're, we're in the worst position in the world to be observing them. Yeah. Which is probably true, I mean, you know, <laughs> So, so the, the new, there are new views now of psychology. One of them, for example, is called eliminativism, which is a $10 word, which means we eliminate these folk psychological categories and see what's left. 
and that's where you get a lot of these uh, philosophies of psychology based on neuroscience and things like that. Um, and so a, a word like belief is just a catchphrase we use to refer to a wide variety of neural states that don't really have anything in common and certainly can't be thought of as a cause of anything as a class, but it's just, it's just, it's a handy way of talking. And uh, this is it Dennett talks about taking the intentional stance where we'll, we'll keep talking that way, but, but really what we're talking about is these neural states. I think it's Dennett. I know it's not Dummett. It's not Davidson, it must be Dennett. Uh, <laughs> Dennett is the um, yeah. philosopher that's uh, very scientifically oriented, I know that, neurologically yeah. oriented. Um, I'm old. My brain is going. I lose names. Uh, I'm just kidding. CRS. Do you use that term? Pardon? CRS. I often say I have CRS. I can't remember stuff. Yeah, I can't remember stuff. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Me, my, for me, my bugbear has always been names. Um, just names are so arbitrary. And one of the things, things my brain does not do is take this arbitrary thing and join it with that arbitrary thing. And naming proper names are just that. And I know there's secrets as to, you know, how you can create these associations, but I've never spent the time doing that, so. I've never um, had a job in sales. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. That's um, right. So if we come back to ethics, the same thing might be true. So before we circle back, hold that, can you hold that thought? Um, yep. So I had the, I don't know, whatever, uh, coincidence, I guess is the right way to say it, uh, bumping into Timothy Leary in the 70s and actually looking a little further than his pop image. Yep. And have you ever run across his work that got him to Harvard, their interpersonal theory of personality. Oh, interesting. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's written in the 50s, based on work at the uh, Kaiser Hospital in Oakland, California, in the psychiatric board. Um, and his theory is we don't have personalities. I, I think you'll like this. Uh, that we don't have, quote, personalities, unquote. Right. That we operate in relation to other people. So it's kind of a connectedness theory of personality. And then at the same time, um, Alan Watts was still alive and had a local radio program. And so I got interested yeah. in Buddhism. And so as there's a lifelong history there. Yeah. And um, the more you study Buddhism, the more you look into it, there's nothing there. It's, yeah. it's all made up. <laughs> you know, the, the harder you look, yeah. The more you find nothing. Um, it's all just a story, as my favorite uh, college professor says. It's um, also uh, a core tenet of Taoism as well. Um, yes. the, the categories that we impose on the world are, in fact, categories that we've imposed on the world. Exactly. And it gets you right back to the root language, the use of language, all that. I mean, that's one yeah. of the reasons I became a craftsman. Um, hmm. because I could spend most of my days being productive and yep. there was no lying or misunderstanding going on. There was, does this thing work at the end of the day? Oh, it works. Let's sell it. See you tomorrow. Kept my life so simple. Like computers. <laughs> and, and, and it's an interesting thing, right? I mean, with computers, uh, it either works or it doesn't. Well, that's not strictly true because... It could work, but produce random results, which is <laughs> that's your probably towards the working model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and and you know and and uh, you know there's even there's even a school of thought that depicts ethics as a, as a technical problem. I, I don't think I'd go that far, but yeah, I mean, and I certainly agree with this perspective that you know, a lot of this, most of this, probably all of this is artificial. 
that these are things that we've created and impose on a state of, you know, well, impose on the world. Um, but I wouldn't use the word term artificial. I mean, they're, they're human creations, just like yeah. the chair you're sitting in. I wouldn't call it artificial. It's a chair. It is what it is. It does what it, it does. Is. Yeah. But, and that's a good point. Uh, constructivism is essentially the idea that we deliberately construct these things right making meaning um but i don't think that that's the case at all um because as you say it's just a chair i mean this is something we're going to do call it a chair whether or not we're a constructivist doesn't mean that the world is naturally or really if we want to put it that way divided into things that are chairs and things that are not chairs uh, you know, we haven't said anything profound about the state of the world by saying this is a chair. Um, in fact, we haven't really said anything about anything at all, um, except maybe ourselves. But if we as a self don't exist. <laughs> well, we have no personality. We, the, we are a piece of protoplasm that, you know, wanders around. Um, you know, and that gets, I mean, that points to the discussion you know, is language an innate feature of this particular mammal species or yeah. not, you know? Yeah. And there's no answer, but the, the whole idea of the language, um, you know, being constructed, being culturally constructed, all that, that's all fine, but maybe it's just yeah. that we like to make noises. Well, and that's it, we make noises. And that's, you know, and I want to be careful here, right? Because I, I don't want to say, well, yeah, we're humans, so naturally we make noises. Because now that's an appeal to some kind of real state of affairs describing what is natural and what isn't. And, and that's no better either, right? We're, we're just back where we started. Uh, we saying, have been selecting for a couple, few hundred thousand years. Well, that's that. the scientific explanation of what has happened, and it's the best explanation we have to point. And, you know, uh, pretty much all of science depends on that particular principle, certainly all of biological science. So if we reject that, we reject all of biological science, which isn't practical, <laughs> um, and, and we're not likely to do it. And even, even if we had evidence, and, and this is an important realization, just in the last 30 or 40 years, maybe 50 years of the philosophy of science, even if we had evidence to show us that evolution is false, we still wouldn't abandon it. Abandon it we would question the evidence because far more of what we do and what we know depends on evolution than could ever depend on that particular evidence. And so, you know, there's this idea that there's this critical experiment that proves evolution is true or proves that it's false just isn't the case. There's this entire assemblage of theory and practical implementation and diagnosis and vaccine research and the whole work. Right through in vaccine just to be topical, um, but but you know what I mean, right? There's this. Now it doesn't mean you have to accept it all or accept none of it. There's plenty of room around the edges for disagreements, but evolution is one of these things where if you disagree with evolution, you're pretty much committed to disagreeing with the entire lot, um, and that's what makes it hard. I wonder now, people sort of assume. There are central principles like that in ethics too. Now, what would be the theory of evolution, for example, in ethics, or what would be the law of gravity in ethics? But yeah, I see you're shaking your head and I'm inclined to agree. That's a lot harder to come by um, because if we look, well, as we have, at the different principles and the different issues that come up um, just doesn't seem to be a center to all of this. Um, there's one, one discussion, what was his name? 
for their names. Uh, lost it. It's here somewhere. Uh, here we go. Uh, Moss and Metcalf saying that ethics maybe is too big a word for what we're after. I think that's about right. Well, in, in, in the sense that the word ethics seems to include uh, corporate values, moral justice, compliance with ethical codes, all of these range of things. I, I'm not sure I agree with that either. I, I, I think I'm perfectly comfortable with the idea of ethics. Um, well, I was surprised that uh, you limited it to institutional ethical codes. I, I hadn't thought of it that way before. Um, and I see the practicality of that. Um, but I came in with that larger idea of ethics, you know, beliefs, mores, yeah. ethical code, you know, as a, as a larger set. Um, yeah. But I see, but doing it this way, I see that that's unworkable. Um, the survey all major that. religions and then, you know, and then your folk ways and, you know, that's an impossible task. So. Yeah, I, I looked at the ethical codes too, because again, they're, they're part of this whole ethics as a club thing. Uh, and it's interesting because we have ethics as a club in the sense of weapon and ethics as a club as in the sense of the people who are together or who are in the know. Um, but if you look at, there's a, I'm putting a link in today's course newsletter uh, referencing uh, a UNESCO report on uh, the ethics of artificial intelligence in education. And if you, and, and the I way I was I dropped that into the sheet, if I remember correctly. Sorry? I think I dropped that into the sheet. I think I added that to the. You may well have. I think I did. I think I was one of the ones. But anyway, I wouldn't yeah. be surprised because the reason why it's in there is because it was sitting on my desktop and I couldn't let go of it. I, I kept going back to it and looking at it a little bit more and going back to it and looking at it a little more. And then yeah. I thought, well, I can't let go of this. So I guess I got to deal with it. But the way I was thinking of it is well, now that we've done this scope of applications and ethical issues and ethical codes. Now we're in a position to properly appreciate that particular document. Hmm. If you look at the references and the examples, they are virtually all of the sorts of things that we've been talking about so far, and especially the, the ethical codes aspect of it. Um, that is the standard of evidence that they're using. Um, but I agree that that's too small a standard. It's too narrow a scope. But back before I did that inquiry, I would talk about ethics. Um, and, and I'm thinking back in, partic in particular to remarks made by Jenny McNess back at the time. Um, who basically said, I should talk, uh, well, while I'm talking about ethics, really I should be looking at these ethical codes, the, the ethics of the profession, that, that my discussion wasn't addressing the current reality of ethics. And, uh, well, that kind of bothered me. Because um, I, I had posted, and I'll, I'll give, I'll provide the link again in, in this week's newsletter. I posted a, basically an overall guide to ethics as it applies to education, and that's when the criticism came out. I said to her back then, this is years ago. Well, yeah, I guess I'll have to address all of that in a part two. She said, "Well, I'm looking forward to part two then." So this is part two. <laughs> uh, this this whole big mess. How are you spelling your last name? M-A-C-K-N-E-S-S. -S. Ah, see, there's my Scottish bias. I always leave the okay. A. Yeah, and it's all lowercase letters. Rhizomatic learning and ethics. Yeah, she's, she's very good. Um, and she, she was 
a participant in some of the earlier courses on connectivism and such. And recently she's been more interested in uh, the bicameral mind guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that was big in the 80s, but I just let that one go. Yeah. Well, I mean, he hasn't, he didn't stop work with the stuff that he did in the 80s. So, yeah, no, he had a tenured position. So, if he's still alive, he's still got that position. Yeah. So, uh, oh, okay. No, not Julian James, who's the one who came up with it, but someone else, someone else. Um, uh, it's a mix something. <laughs> another one. Yeah, another one. And I can't find it. Um, Origin of Consciousness Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, 76, Princeton psychologist Julian James. Yeah. But that's not the person who she's studying. It's something like McGillivary or something. Uh, oh, Ian Gilchrist. I think uh, Mick Gilchrist. There we go. That's who she's been studying. Um, so, and and I haven't been following that particular. Well, I've been following it, but not nearly as closely as I would need to in order to be able to comment reasonably on what she's been learning about that. So I won't. But I, but I. That's where her study has gone since then. But I still follow what she's doing. Um, yeah, so uh, one of the top searches here is a wiki, wiki one, but mm -hmm. it calls it bicameral mentality, which takes it beyond the biology. Yeah. yeah. In the psychology, it looks like. So, so yeah, I'll look at that. But again, it's you know, emissary. Reminds me of uh, the alphabet versus the goddess, another bicameral mind mm -hmm. theory. Do you remember that? That was from the seventies, I think. No, uh, but I, I can I can credit. probably construct it from that title. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, it was a, you know it was an interesting theory, but uh, then he he kind of lost his way, and so he's, he discredited yeah. himself. But, a lot of this stuff goes back to some of the early psychological experiments that involved severing the corpus callosum, which is the bundle of nerves that uh, join the two hemispheres of the brain, two hemispheres of the brain. And those resulted in almost like split personalities in the, in the sense that uh, it was like we now had two different people in there. Um, and so you think, well, if we had two different people, and then and then we get you know all the characterizations of the different character of these two different people and drawing on the right side of the brain and all of that. Um, I'm not really a fan of you know right brain left brain theory, um, and the reason for that is that it just describes way too much to innateness into, you know, the actual construction of the human brain, then I think is appropriate. I don't think you can make brains, either left or right hemisphere, that focus on art or focus on reasoning. You know, even if that's how yeah, they, they come out. You know, it's, it's not a biology or a neurology, it's a mentality. I get that, you know, you know and all the research, the recent research on plasticity and Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people, you know, now we have all these veterans in the United States, we have all these veterans with brain injuries to study. Yeah. And so they're watching the brain recover functions by just moving from the damaged area. To, so the plasticity argument, yeah. you know, works against that. But yet, yeah, there is a certain bicameral mentality, um, mm -hmm. you know, and then handedness comes in and then um, I deliberately became ambidextrous. I up right-handed and then yeah. because of my trade um, and an accident to my right hand uh, I was already interested in handedness and it worked on dexterity in my left hand but then I had an accident and cut uh, some tendons 
and a nerve in my right hand. And so for a couple of years, I worked left-handed basically. Yeah. And, and after that, the work got a lot easier and you can do multiple things if both of your hands know what they're doing. And then you think about that, it's like, so, you know, and then there's supposedly the, the cross, you know, uh, use of the nervous system and, you know, what's my brain doing if I, if I have my hands doing two different things at the same time. And then, you know, that's just, that's just juggling. So, I mean, it's all, it's all connected. It's all interesting. And, there's, and again, we don't understand it. And I think all of that applies to ethics, all of it. <laughs> and that I think is the distinction between the approach that I'm taking here and the approach that you find in the UN document and the codes of ethics approach. And for that matter, even um, the approach that ethics is something that, you know, we go through, you know, formal or semi-formal reasoning about that ethics is something that we discover as though it were mathematics or invent as though it were a categorization system for the world. I, uh, I'm, I'm looking for, and I, I think have a sense of something that is more basic than that, something that is like learning to become left-handed or something that is like, um, you know, the plasticity of mind um, as, you know, the basis for our story of ethics, whatever that's going to be. Um, so since we're doing this informally, I assume that you're not going to post this as today's thing. You'll do your slideshow or not, whatever you're going to do. Anyway, I have oh, a well, I'm going to post run. this discussion <laughs> okay. unless you have some objection to it. Oh, not at see. all. Not at all. It's just, so I have this um, overriding question that I didn't want to disrupt your presentations with. Um, but here's the perfect opportunity because also, you know, we've been here almost an hour or so. Um, mm -hmm. So why is it that the people with the most elaborate codes of ethics, why is it those professions do the most unethical things? The Catholic Church, American lawyers, and I include higher education. Yeah. Why is it the ones with the most elaborate codes of ethics are the people that are, you know, in my view, destroying the culture? And, and there's, the I think there's two answers to that. One part of the answer is found in Voltaire's Bastards. Okay. And the other part of the answer is found in the short, simple expression, they can. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I know that sounds terrible, but, um, you know. Well, and it goes to the power of the class, you know, those classes that have those codes also have mm -hmm. the power. And yeah. that goes back to last week. It's people will act unethically no matter what you do. Yeah. So, um, so it's the, it's the uh, confluence of power and uh, deviance. I, you know, I have a sociology degree, so it's power and deviance uh, together. But here's, here's the, and this, this looks forward a bit to where we're gonna go at the end of the course. There's probably a good way of finishing off for today. Um, we see all of this and, you know, we see the activities that, that you've just described, the, the things that lawyers do, that the church does, etc. And we say that it's unethical. Who are we to say this? Well, by their own standards. See, that's the thing, by their own code yeah. of ethics, not my yeah. code. Yeah, well, okay, but sure, they, they may be hypocrites, or they they may be saying one thing and doing another, uh, which I guess is sort of the same thing. Um, but, you know, we have to also take into account the fact that we just might not understand what ethics really are. Um, and that although we might go along or, you know, maybe even be convinced by this charade that says, for example, killing is wrong. If we really understood ethics, maybe we'd see that, no, in fact, killing is right. 
and it's we who are mistaken. Or let's take even a worse approach. Well, maybe worse is the wrong word. Uh, a more disturbing or dramatic. A more, you know, a more empirical approach. Oh, right? okay. okay. What if ethics actually is what we all believe and what we all do ethically? What if, you know, meaning is use, as Wittgenstein would say? Mm -hmm. Then it turns out that the actual ethics that humanity as a whole believes in allows that killing is good. And, and why do we say that? Well, look what we do. Look at the evidence. Look at yeah. the evidence. Yeah. Right? So if you got a problem with that, maybe the problem is with your understanding of ethics. Now, not really something I want to support particularly, but I think that's something that we need to take seriously. And, Absolutely. you know, you know, I mean, we, we talk about, you know, taking a gap based approach, right? Um, what if cynically ethics just is a tool that say the powerful use to control the less powerful? Uh, you know, it's, you know, there's the, it's not actually in the outline or in any of my work at all, but there's just the whole philosophy of Nietzsche fits in nicely here. Um, you know, with his, you know, what, what would Superman's ethics be? Uh, you know, um, or there's the philosophy of the transvaluation of value. What if we took all of our values and flipped them upside down? So right is wrong, good is bad, Etc., or what we consider bad is actually good. What would our objections to that be? And, and we find that there really aren't any, none that don't sound like rationalizations. So that I think is something that we need to take seriously as well. So, and that's, that's pretty much the focus of the second part of the course. But in there is this considerable speed bump which is the duty of care. And that's what makes things really interesting to me. Anyway. Yes. yes, because then you, then you have a different set of evidence. You have a different set uh, of evidence. That, you know, it um, explains the story differently. If yes. it's just power, okay. I mean, I actually yeah. kind of believe that. I kind of believe that the, the world is upside down, that we say one thing and do the opposite. Mm. Um, you know, growing up in America, it's pretty easy yeah. to, to have that point of view. Um, yeah. But yeah, but then you really problematize it. There's one of one of my big words I learned in college. Um, <laughs> to problematize that approach by adding the uh, duty of care or yeah. the um, uh, cautionary principle or mal not malfeasance, it's mal efficacy. Okay. Uh, no, that's not it. Anyway, it's it's uh, it's mal something. Very principle in one word, mal something. Anyway, um, yeah. When you add that, then you can um, analyze yeah. the act, you know, the the the, the reality of it, um, and then try to tease that out from the ethical codes and see how. Yeah. Okay, I think that's a good note to finish on. I'm going to do this presentation this afternoon. It'll show up in the newsletter as well as the presentation from last week. That'll finish off last week. Um, plus the link. And I've got some fun toys planned for this week as well. I just have to code them. <laughs> but uh... <laughs> Yeah, and I need to catch up a bit anyway. Um, I haven't done my links yet. I have, I have done some tweets and, you know, put some stuff in the document, but uh, I need to yeah. do my link. Plus, I have homework as a class through the night. So, anyway. Yep. Busy, busy. <laughs> All right. All right. See you later. Talk to you later.